talking about the King's principles tonight, we're going to do a little bit of a review. Uh, not much, but we're going to do a little bit of a review uh, tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about, again, true righteousness. Amen. And there is true righteousness. And you're not the one that defines it. Lord Jesus Christ defines it. And, uh, and so, he is the master. He is the master teacher. Amen. And we're going to go, again, back to the book of Matthew. Amen. We're going to go to Matthew chapter uh, 5. We're going to verse number 3. We're just going to read down probably to verse uh, verse 12. And then we'll just, we, we talked about the, these things last week. What true righteousness is. When, when Jesus began to teach, it was amazing. We will actually read a, a scripture a little later on. How much he amazed them. Uh, they were used to the Pharisees. Uh, the way that they appeared, what they said how they dressed, and, uh, and he is basically going to upset uh, their, their concepts quite, quite, a, quite a lot. In fact, you will read numerous times within the Gospels that there is absolutely open hostility to Jesus. And, uh, and it's not coming from uh, the man that's a sinner that knows he's a sinner. It's coming from people that would think themselves to be righteous. Amen. And uh, the Pharisees, when they, uh, what they taught that righteousness was an external thing. And so everything they did was on the outside. It was for the benefit of impressing other people. Of course, when Jesus came, uh, he was different. He talked about the internal. You know, so the, the Pharisees were all about obeying rules and regulations. Okay, that was what they're all about. You know, just, you know, I will not be able to go into great detail here tonight. But uh, living for God, there are things that we need to do. There are ways that we need to walk. Amen. In fact, hey, before we even read that, would you go to First Thessalonians chapter 4? We're going to read verse 1 through 4. And then we'll come back to, to uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 3. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul is, is uh, speaking uh, to the Thessalonica church. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. That's beautiful scripture there, sis. <laughs> hallelujah. Amen. So you all found it? Well, somebody read it for me then. Verse, okay, here we go. We, if somebody else reading it was enough. <laughs> Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. So the Apostle Paul is talking to these believers, and he's telling them, you know, you receive from us ways that you were to walk, and ultimately, everything was with the purpose of pleasing God. Before we read the next verse, I, I want to just make some comments. God, God moved here in a wonderful way on Sunday. He really did. Amen. And I saw people have some breakthroughs. But let, let me tell you what, what's going to keep that door open. Righteousness. Okay. Putting the word of God in your heart. Amen. The Spirit of God operates to break through uh, whatever walls and shells that are there. And we submit and surrender. But then the purpose of God uh, is concerning the way he operates, his Spirit does that. But his Word is what brings us to change. Okay. And so I've, I've seen this. Uh, I'm not, I've been around long enough to know that when God operates, when God moves... Amen. People will break through. But then I've also been around long enough to see them regress back into the shell that they were in. Okay. And, and it was not God's fault. It's simply there has to be the application of the word of God in our life. 
I told your missionary, told me years ago that walking with God was like a bird. One wing was the spirit and the other wing was the word of God. And the bird don't fly unless both wings are operating. Okay, and that's really how it is in living for God. Amen. There are people that place a heavy emphasis on spirit. And that's all they place an emphasis on. Spirit in their life is very, very sloppy. All right? Very sloppy. Amen. So we, we need to place an emphasis on spirit and also on word. Praise God. All right. So he said to me, ought to walk and to please God. Uh, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Amen. For this is the will of God. He says, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Amen. One more verse. Let's read one more verse. That no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such as also we have forewarned you and testified. Amen. Amen. So the word of God is, is that that. That strength, in fact, uh, the scripture says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Right. Amen. And so again, the word of God is that strength that keeps me from sin. Right. Hallelujah. It really does. And I'm telling you, whatever progress you made in God on Sunday, I thank the Lord for. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I got to tell you, you got to you got to solidate that ground, amen. Just like when there's a breakthrough in warfare, amen. If you just break through and you do nothing to come in behind and begin to fortify and build up, you will lose what you had. Are, are y'all hearing me tonight? Hallelujah, hallelujah. And so. Jesus begins to lay down some very powerful principles. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse number 3. He says to us, blessed are the poor in spirit. Everybody say the poor in spirit. Now when we talked to you last week, well, again, I'm, just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in these areas. Uh, the poor in spirit was dealing with our attitude towards ourself. How do you, what do you think about yourself? It's, it's, it's to be honest with yourself. It's that, okay, uh, we know ourselves, we accept ourselves, and we try to be ourselves to the glory of God. Amen. Walking with Jesus is not about a bunch of cookie cutters. You know, we all, you know, you know. You, you go to some churches and you know who the preacher is or you know what church they're from. We had a brother that used to wear a bow tie. Amen. A brother, a good brother. Amen. And you knew who was from his church because a lot of the young men in the church were wearing bow ties. <laughs> Amen. Nothing wrong with that. Amen. Nothing wrong with it. But we, again, hallelujah, must develop our walk with God. Amen. And not measure ourselves by others, but measure ourselves by ourselves. Praise God. Amen. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 5, I'm just going to Again, say something here and then we'll move on. So our attitude towards our sub, blessed are those that are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Amen. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 5, Paul says to us, Therefore I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. And then he goes on to say, even though... I, I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Amen. Now, it almost sounds like he is boasting, but he's not boasting. He's just letting them know, hey, I'm an apostle. Amen. And they're apostles, and that's a good thing, you know, and they have their gifts and talents, and I have my gifts and talents. That's also a good thing. Amen. And then he goes on, he will say in the 10th verse, I am what I am by the grace of God. Hey, brothers and sisters, it's time for you to exercise yourself in God. It's time for you to develop your ministry. It's time for you to do the work of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Keep a right attitude. Keep a right spirit. Amen. And God will take you somewhere. The moment you get a lousy attitude, 
is the moment you're going to stop dead in your tracks. It's like you blew an engine. I mean, you ever blown an engine? Yeah, yeah I did one on 94 one time. On a, an alliance, the thing overheated and that thing just froze up. And I wasn't going to go nowhere. I just coasted to the side of the road. Because it was all over and it was about 5 in the morning or actually maybe a little earlier than that. And it was time for me to reach out and call somebody because I wasn't going to go nowhere. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So our attitude towards ourself Praise God is so important. Uh, I, I, I guess I am going to talk a little bit about this. You, you can forgive in your past. You know, you are to be forgiven from your past, you understand. It's under the blood of Jesus. Amen. What you're building for now is toward your future. Amen. What you are applying yourself to now, amen, is so important. And again, so when he talks here about blessed are the poor in spirit, it's the, our attitude towards ourself. Then he goes on to Matthew chapter 5, again, verse 4 through 6. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Okay, and again, I'm just I'm grouping these. It's our attitude towards sin. Amen. As a believer, we need to mourn over sin. We need, need to despise sin. As a believer, when the word of God is given to us, we need to handle it meekly. Hallelujah. That's what the word of God teaches. It says in James chapter 1 and verse 21, we're to lay aside all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Amen. Your resistance to God is an indication that you are not meek. But blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Some people don't like to be told they're wrong. Some people don't like to have be confronted about their actions, their sin. Amen. But the meek, amen, they're going to inherit the earth because they recognize, amen, the need and the importance of of correction. I thank God that he corrects me. I, I, I'm thankful that he deals with my heart. I have never changed without him first convicting me. And it's, if I begin to resist that, immediately the process in me is my heart becomes hard. It takes time, but it becomes hard. Amen. Then you, you got to sing six songs before I can finally find Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? You know how to be now? You walk in the house, you already found him long before you got in the door. You know, you know some people, they're, they're warmed up when we're all done and we're ready to sit down. Why wasn't you with us when we first started this thing? I, I'm not trying to be ugly here. I'm just, because somewhere their, their heart was hardened. And it was an indifferent heart. And as God began to melt through that, they began to respond to God. So our attitude towards sin is important. We mourn over our sin. We despise our sin. Amen. We don't, not my neighbor's sin. Turn your neighbor and say, not your sin. Turn your neighbor and say, not your sin. We're not here about your sin. No, not about your sin at all. But our sin. My sin. Hallelujah. I take care of my sin. Amen. I want a right attitude. You know, there's a proverb that says in the word of God that those that stiffen their neck will suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. And so God, has, and it's proven through the word of God many times, amen, that God deals with mankind. He dealt with Israel and he dealt with Israel for uh, a period of almost a hundred, couple hundred years. And they kept fighting and resisting him. And, and the day came that there was absolutely no remedy. When you read the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. There's a, there's a reason he's weeping. He can't offer them hope about right now. 
He can offer them hope in the future. That's the verse that everybody likes to use. Uh, Jeremiah, was it 29, 11, or Isaiah 29, 11, You know, they, or Jeremiah 29, 11. They, they like that verse because, because of what it says. But you got to understand what's fixing to happen. They're fixing to go into captivity. They're fixing to go to Babylon. And God is still saying to them, hey, I, I, you know, I, I, I love you and I care about you. And I got a plan for you. But you ain't been listening to me. And so you got to go through the process. So our attitude towards sin is so important. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Hallelujah. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Praise God. And then let's move on down 5, 7. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You want mercy? Give mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And again, now we've gone from an attitude towards our sin, so an attitude towards the Lord. Hallelujah. He gave me mercy. Amen. That's why I've been born again, because of his mercy. Not only that, but he purified my heart. He gave me a pure heart. Yes, he did. And he put peace in in me. If you don't have peace tonight, it's saying something about your relationship with the master. Because he is the prince of peace and he brings peace. And, he, and our hearts are so changed that we become peacemakers. Hello. So my I attitude towards the Lord, God was merciful to me. God gave me a pure heart. Amen. He, he gave me his peace. I have that now within. And because I've received mercy, I want to share mercy with others. Amen. He's given me a pure heart so that others may see my life. There, there's nothing worse than people that claim to be believers. And they're no different than everybody else around them. Hallelujah. That's, that's not good. That's not good at all. Amen. My, uh, my dad... I remember him telling a story years ago when he worked as a carpenter. You know, he, they called him Will. We called him WV, but they called him Will on the job. Amen. And uh, he's just talking with one of the guys. And the guy told him, you know, he says, I go to, you know, I go to, uh, I see guys go to church on Sunday. And by Sunday afternoon, they're, they're, they're right next to me in the bar. In other words, what he was saying you know, what, what's this about going to church kind of business when they're just like me? You know, and I don't even go to church. All right. And so here we are tonight. We share what God has done with us. We share how he wants to work in us. You know, we are supposed to be a channel of his mercy, his purity, and his peace. I want to get on a tangent tonight, which I could easily get on a tangent. Chase a couple of hound dogs down the road, get in, get in a rabbit trail, and then find a couple of squirrels while I'm doing that. It could get pretty bad here tonight. I, I, I know that. I know it's possible for me to do that, and I have done it quite, quite often. Our world needs mercy. It really does. It needs mercy. It doesn't dispense a lot of mercy, but it needs mercy. And so you are channels of that tonight. You have the ability. You really do. If Jesus is living in you, you, you got it, man. You got the goods. Turn your neighbor and say, you got the goods. The problem with some of us, we never unwrap the package. It's been sitting in our living room for years. You know, that, that's what Jesus gave you. Why don't you open the thing up? You know, come on. How many of your kids would, how many of you, your kids would, would, uh, would let you leave their presence under a tree for six months? Fat chance. They'd be, they'd be on you every day. When are we going to open this? When, or, or your birthday for that matter. Well, this is your birthday present. Isn't that nice? We're going to sit on the table. We're going to walk by it for six months. That's your birthday present. <laughs> it's nice. You know, no, no. You're, those children will drive you out of your mind because they'll want to open up what's their gift. And I don't blame them. I'd want to open up my gift too. But some of us don't understand what God has 
given to us. And it's because we've never completely unwrapped the package. Hallelujah. And so, hey, I'm happy living for God. I'm feeling good about living for God. I'm glad to be here tonight. This is, this is no big deal to me. I, I love coming to the house of God. In fact, I sort of love you folks too, although some of you is, I love you anyways. That was intentional. That was intentional. My wife says I'm like that. I am like that. That poor woman has to live up with my provoking her every day of her life. I'm just trying to help her build Jesus in. Say, <laughs> so what about you? Just get in control yourself. Oh, wait a minute. That, that could work my way too, couldn't it? All right. Matthew 5, 10 through 16 begins, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you are reviled and persecute you. And say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. You are the salt of the earth. Now this is an attitude towards the world. Alright. If you're going to live for God you are going to get negative comments made to you. You know, some people feel that their person could just say somebody's called them a holy roller. Give me a break. I remember as a kid, as a kid, there it comes. It was, you know, we walked up uphill both ways to school. And yeah, yeah, it was just, it was rough. I remember as a kid when, the, when our church was in town. As a kid, we, we, had, we had kids throw shingles up the middle aisle. I mean, the door was right there, and you could w walk in the door, and you could look right up the middle aisle, right to the pulpit. We had a pianist playing the piano with a door, and the, there was a glass, and a rock came through the glass, broke the glass, came into the church. Hallelujah. Now, that's probably a little bit more on the line, a little bit of persecution, than just somebody calling you a holy roller. I mean, when, when you all going to get the Holy Ghost enough that that stuff just doesn't bother you anymore? Hallelujah. I, I had, when I, when I started walking with God on the job, amen, I'd go walking down and he'd say, hallelujah. That's what they'd say to me. You know, and money, I, I, I'm not going to let that stuff get to me. I'm not going to get worked up. I'm not going to get mad. I'm not, you know what I say to him? Hey, you're practicing to come to church. That's good. That's what I tell him. A friend of mine, his name was Bob. Bob wasn't living for God. I could, he wasn't living for God. He comes up to me one one day at work, and he says to me, says, how are all you saints doing? And he's smiling, grinning. I said, pretty good. How's all you sinners doing? <laughs> he says, that's hidden below the belt. But, he, but we are both smiling. In other words, there are things that they're, they're not really persecution. And if that's all it takes to sink your ship, you already had a bunch of holes in the ship, okay? Praise God. And so our attitude towards the wall, you see, God has called us to be salt and light. Okay? And again, we're not of the world. The Bible will teach us that. Amen. When we, the problem, amen, is, well, here's, here's how do I say this? We're, we're in a ship. And as long as the water's outside the ship, we're good to go. But if the water ever gets in the ship, we got a problem. All right? You know, uh, when I was on board a, a cruise liner one time, they made us practice one time, amen, to where we're supposed to go for the rife, the rife boats. Yeah, the lifeboats. <laughs> and, and so my wife and I made our way down there, and, and uh, you know, we didn't even get to, we were, the, we were in the next group over, but the guy said, oh, that's okay. And I'm thinking to myself, it may not be okay. What are you saying, man? You know? But anyways, amen. So when we, we're salt. Now when salt loses its taste, it's no good. So God, is, God wants me to be salt. Not only that, he again wants me to be light. And the Bible teaches us in verse 16, we're to let our light so shine among men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Our attitude towards the world. So, 
It's our attitude towards ourselves, our attitude towards sin, our attitude towards the Lord, and our attitude towards the world. That's, that's what true righteousness is dealing with. Are, are you still with me? All right. Now, let's get to where... Now we're, we're getting into new territory tonight. Let's go to verse 17. I am, I am done at 20 after for the clock watchers. I, I already know I'm not going to finish tonight. I already knew that. I already knew when I, before I walked in the door. I knew. Hallelujah. So if you all will pay attention, get with me. Not run in and out. Amen. Give, give me your attention. We, we'll, we'll get this thing done in 20 minutes. At least part of it. All right. So, verse 17. Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay. Verse 18. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these com commandments teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. For whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I, and this, here, here it is now, verse 20. This is the key verse to the entire message that Jesus is preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus started talking about the blessings, blessed are you, and you're persecuted, and blessed are the pure in heart, when he began to say those things to that audience, Amen. They, they were saying to themselves, you got to put yourself there. They were saying to themselves, we, we can never attain to that kind of character. How can we have this righteousness that Jesus is talking about? Where does it come from? You see, they had never, ever heard anybody talk like this before. May I say to you that the Pharisees and the scribes had caused the word of God. You, you know what barnacles are? They, they get on ships. So they get on boats in the, you know. They, 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 they take away the ability for you to, you know, to cruise and uh, slow you down and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, now, I, I like fried food. How did that cut in here? Just hang out with me here. Okay, you know, the Word of God had been so encrusted with the traditions of the elders and the things that they added to it that they were literally making the Word of God of no effect. In fact, that which was supposed to be alive was dead. And so when Jesus begins to speak to them. They, again, have not heard things of this sort before. And so they're asking themselves, how does this relate to our lives? What about the law of Moses? What about the law? Amen. And I'm here to tell you now, listen to me carefully. The law of Moses, God's law, certainly reveals his standard for holy living. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Pharisees thought they were defending it. And they sought to obey it. But yet the scripture teaches us they fell quite short. And again I go back to that verse 20 and read to you again. For I say to you. That unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. True righteousness that pleases God exceeds the scribes and Pharisees. Now, I'm, we're not going over there, but if you, if you remember in the 18th chapter of Luke, that, that, that Pharisee looked across and saw the publican over there. 
And he says, I thank God I'm not like that guy. He's a real joker over there. I don't know if he'll ever get saved. You know, he's probably on his way to the bad place. You know, I, I, I fast twice a week. I pray and I, I give alms. You see, that's how he measured, or that's how they measured their righteousness. Okay, nuts those coming. Now, I don't need a card on how to kiss my wife. I, I, just got, I just got a shoehorn, and they gave me instructions with the shoehorn. You know? And uh, pretty simple. You just stick it in the back of, your, back of your shoe and slide your heel down in it, and it should work. I mean, you may need instructions how to pucker up, son. But, but I've been doing it a long time. Can you imagine how it would be if, if you go home and your husband says, Hey, honey, I want to kiss you. And then you're standing there and he's, he's reading this. Okay, uh, pucker your lips. You know, close your eyes for the big surprise. First of all, you'd be laughing so hard that that would be the end. That would spoil the moment. It'd be gone. All right, now, why are you saying this? I'll tell you why. Because that's how people can be. They live for God by rote. It's not a relationship. It's just getting everything done they need to get done. And when they get it done, then they're good to go. My God, that's not how we live. For God. You know, we're, we're praying, we're trying to pray an hour, you know, a day. You know, and you each got your different times that you're praying an hour a day. You know, and, and if, I, I, you know, I, I hope nobody's like this. Mine's at 2 o'clock in the morning. 1.59, okay. 2 o'clock, okay, here we go. You know, 2.59, okay. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's a relationship. But you see, you, people reduce a relationship with God down to mere formalities and down to just making sure you dot the I's and cross the T's. That's not what God intended at all. And so the the Jewish community is hearing Jesus say to, to the, everybody there, including the Pharisees, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And they thought to themselves, the most holy people in the community are the Pharisees. And if the Pharisees cannot attain what hope is there for anyone else? Now, I got 12 minutes left. So we go back to verse 17. We will not cover all these tonight. But Jesus began to explain his own attitude towards the law by describing three possible relationships all right he said in verse 17 do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets and so we can look at God's law we can seek to destroy the law this is exactly what the Pharisees thought that Jesus was doing, that he was destroying the law. That's what they thought. All right. We read in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 and 29, if you could go there, Ginger. This is at the very end of his sermon. All right. The Bible says, and so it was, 
When Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching. Verse 29, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. His authority did not come from any recognized school of that day. Amen. It wasn't some rabbi that everybody thought was popular and he really had it. His authority, amen, did not come from any of those people. Amen. They would teach from authorities. Jesus was teaching with authority. There is a difference. You can teach from authority. He said this, but not Jesus. He said, it is written. He spoke with authority. Hallelujah. Amen. He did not again come to destroy the law of God. Listen to me carefully. He was speaking against those who again were literally destroying the law. Jesus, by the account of the Pharisees, defied the law. In their eyes, Jesus defied the law. Let me remind you who Jesus is. He is God manifest in flesh. He's the one that met with Moses on the mount. Okay? If you listen to Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, the Bible says he entered again into the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand. And the Bible says in verse 2, they watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. They know what's coming. They know what's coming. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And the scripture says they said nothing. And he looked around at them and the Bible says when he looked at them, he looked at them with anger. He was grieved because he saw the hardness of their hearts. When are we going to get in love with the Word of God? If all you can do when you look at people around you is be harsh, you are not in love with the Word of God. You know who the Word of God is? It's Jesus. And they were so concerned about catching Him doing what they thought was wrong that they kept silent and then, of course, he would tell the man to stretch out his hand, and the man's hand would be restored. And look at what verse 6 says. Now, these are supposed to be righteous men. Then the Pharisees went out immediately, and they plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. In some renditions, it says they were mad. Okay, just out of their mind mad, and how they could destroy Jesus. He deliberately healed people on the Sabbath day. He paid no attention to the traditions of the elders. This is probably as far, well, let me go a little bit farther here. Not only that, Mark chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors... And sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many. And they followed him. Now these guys, these are bad jokers, man. Tax collectors, sinner, bad jokers. You know. I mean, if you if you're buy them, they may rub off on you. That will not be good for you. Okay. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors... And the sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that 
he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. How much Holy Ghost you got? How much of the Word of God you got? That you can't sit down with somebody that's living a wrong life and you're afraid that somehow they're going to... You know, when I was a kid, we used to talk about girls having cooties. <laughs> and I still remember a woman on, on our bus going home from school. Her first name was Wanda. I will not give you her last name. But that poor girl had to put up with taunting. And, and the guys would say, hey, you got Wanda. You got her cooties. You got her germs. And that poor woman, that young lady would have to get off the bus. Amen. When, give me a break. You should have enough Holy Ghost that you can stand there with somebody pie-eyed and drunk. And, now this is going to really, she can be half naked and you ain't thinking about laying with her. And if you ain't got enough Holy Ghost, then you better spend a lot of time in prayer. And you better get into the Word of God. All right? Quit your griping and complaining about a sinful world. Duh. That's what sinful people do. You know, well, they don't talk right. Well, duh, that's right they don't talk right. They don't act right. They don't think right. They don't walk right. But you're supposed to be light and salt. Well, they were trying to preserve the Word of God. That's what, that's what the Pharisees were all about. But, in, you know, uh, they were actually trying to conserve it. Let, let me put it like that. Conserve God's Word. The reality was they were preserving it. They were embalming it. All right. They had embalmed it so much it no longer had any life. If you're so concerned about it, why don't you just stop and pray for them? Out loud. Ask them, can I pray for you? Either one of two things are going to happen. No, or yes, or they'll hurry on down the street if you're so concerned that somehow they're going to affect you. All right? Come on. All right. Mark chapter 7. Jesus was asked in verse 5, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Okay. And the response of Jesus was in verse 6. He quotes from Isaiah. He says to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Verse 8, laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Verse 13, if I could tell, well, let's go down to verse, verse 10. I'm going to tell you what people do that just, they just, you know, Okay, I'm, they just they try to be so careful. You know that uh, I knew somebody that one step out of crack. What's wrong with you, man? You he weren't right. Okay, the Bible says in verse ten for Moses said, "Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses his father and mother, let him be put to death." But you say. You see, you're, you, you see, there's always a way around God's word. All right? But you say if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin, that is a gift of God, then you no longer need to let him do it. Need, you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. And he says in verse 13, you make the word of God of no effect through your traditions that you were handed down. And so they said that Jesus was destroying the law. No, he wasn't. 
You know, let me, let me just, I'm closing with this. You know how you destroy the law? You fulfill it. That's how you, that's how you destroy the law. If you want to you really talk about it. Their religion was a dead ritual. They didn't have loving relationships. It was artificial. Therefore, it would not produce any life. It made them proud. Let's stand tonight. Not humble. It led to bondage and not liberty. So how do you handle God's word? How do you handle it? Well, they, uh, they handled it by trying to destroy it. And the one that they said was destroyed was not destroying it. He was fulfilling it. We'll get into that the next time we get together in this area. So where are we at tonight, ladies and gentlemen? Let's take a moment and pray. Are you walking in true righteousness? Or is it just the letter of the law? You just do things because the pastor tells you you need to do them. Or is it in your heart? Are you being led of the Spirit? Because that's what we're going to talk about the next time we get together. Being led of the Spirit of God. How do you fulfill true righteousness in your life? By being led of the Spirit of God. So let's talk to him in closing tonight. Father, we come to you. We're grateful and thankful for your word. It's forever settled in heaven. It's true. My God, you are the example of true righteousness. I want, I want that righteousness thriving and working in my life. Hallelujah that you give. I thank you. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Oh God, oh God. Fill us, refresh us, renew us. Help us, oh God, as we move forward. Amen. Sunday was wonderful, God, but Sunday's past now. Hallelujah. And oh God, we need to continually build ourselves in you. Amen. Reinforcing the things that you give to us. I pray that our hearts would be open to the word of God. I pray that we would respond to you. We give praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name.